But Jesus was put in a pit. And it was dark. And what his family and his nation, and when I say his family, his family of his Israel family, meant for harm, God turned into good. That while Jesus was being tried and beaten and crucified, God was saving the world. And so Jesus was saying, what you meant to do harm to me, God is bringing good. And that's why Jesus was able to say, Father, God, forgive them. Because Jesus' focus was not necessarily on a pit or a prison or a crown of thorns or a whip or the nails or the cross. His focus was on you and on me. And he said, I love them. I love them so much and this is worth it. So that they don't have to experience hell. So that they don't have to experience the punishment. I will go through hell. I will go through punishment for them. And what was meant as something that could be so horrifying and wicked, God brought good out of it. And that's what forgiveness does. It releases us. It restores us. And it renews us. And this is what Ananias is learning. And so verse 13 says this. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to all the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. Now notice what Ananias was focusing on. And notice what Jesus was focusing on. Ananias starts off and says, I have heard what this man has done. Ananias was focused on Paul's past, his mistakes, his problems. But look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, Go, this man is my chosen. Jesus is focusing on his future, on his purpose. And this is what the love of God does. It's just like I said last week about our past. Our past cannot define you. Our past cannot detain you. So don't let your past derail you. And when we come to Jesus, that's what happens is that our past gets wiped away. Our sins are thrown as far as the east is from the west, right? And so when Jesus calls us, when Jesus shows love to us, Jesus is focused on your future. Jesus is focused on who you're going to become. Jesus is focused on your purpose to change the world. And we all have that purpose. We come to Christ. And so when it comes to loving our enemies, we need to do this. To love others, I must not put limits on Christ's love. I must not put limits on Christ's love. Ephesians said, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints. And this is the love of God right here. It's, it's, we can't even grasp it. How wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ? That means that Christ's love does not run out. You can continually draw that water of grace from a never-ending well. It's never going to run out. It's never going to dry out. Your love never fails. It never runs out, right? We're just saying that. And I love this. I think I saw this on Facebook, and I, I hope I don't butcher it. But it says, I can't boast about my love for God because I fail him every day. But I can boast about the love of my God because he never fails me. He never fails you. He never gives up. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. The psalmist said this, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the hot heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Now remember, when the psalmist wrote this, they weren't sending satellites and ships into space, right? They don't know how wide and how long and how deep 
and how vast the universe is. And so the psalmist is basically saying, you cannot put a limit. You cannot measure God's love. It goes beyond the heavens. It goes beyond the universe. It goes through eternity because if God is love and God is eternal, that means love is also eternal. And you can't change it. So I want to ask you this today. I want you to think about this. And I, I'm just going to ask you to think of one person. And if you don't have any enemies, if you're not an odds enemy, praise God. That's, that's awesome. But if you are, who is someone that I need to start praying for forgiveness for? Who's someone that I need to start taking that step of the love of grace? Just like Ananias is now starting to take that step to go show love to a man that wanted to beat him and kill him and destroy him because of his faith. So who is somebody that I need to start praying for forgiveness? Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What does that tell me? It is to love others. I must realize that Christ does not give up on people. He doesn't give up on his people. Now, if you've been hurt by somebody, it doesn't justify what they've done. It doesn't say, okay, what they've done is okay. What we just want them to do is come to Christ and just repent and find the forgiveness and love of Christ so that they can be changed the image of Christ. In other words, so that they can become better people. That's really our prayer. Because look at Saul. Saul did so much better work for God when he came to Christ than in his religious zeal of killing and murdering and attacking people. And what was, what was the change? Paul discovered love. He discovered grace. And isn't that what we really want for everybody? We want them to find grace and love. The Bible says that we don't fight with weapons of the world. But we fight with weapons of truth and grace. The weapons of the world that fight with Pain and hurt. And, and, I, and I, you know, I'm a huge supporter of our military. And I appreciate what they did. And I'm not a pacifist. If somebody's doing something wrong, we need to go take care of business and protect this nation and protect our freedom. And I'm a huge supporter of that. But as Christians and as soldiers of the cross, we fight with different weapons through prayer and grace and truth and love. And so we must realize that Christ does not give up on people. <coughs> Listen to what Paul said in Philippians. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You hear that? He began a good work, and he's not going to stop just because you made a mistake or you messed up or you slipped up or you, you made some sin or you made some wrong decision. It doesn't mean that Jesus is going to say, all right, well, I can't use you. You're fired. I don't know if Jesus firing anybody. I know people that probably resigned, but I don't know if Jesus ever firing people from the kingdom. Because Jesus doesn't just give us a second chance. He gives us a third chance, a fourth chance. I've already lost count of how many chances he given me. It's probably in the millions. But what it tells me is that he is continuing that good work, and he will carry it out to completion. As long as you keep walking with him, as long as you keep following him, yeah, you're going to stumble, you're going to trip. The people around you are going to stumble and trip. They're going to make mistakes. Yeah, we're, their sin's going to crouch at our doors. But if we keep walking with Jesus, if we keep running that race and we don't give up, I guarantee you, you are going to come to completion. And you're going to find success. And he's going to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come to eternity. Come to my kingdom and rule with me. He who began a good work will carry it out to completion. This is a man named Kamal Salim. 
Kamal Salim is from Libya. Because Kamal Salim was raised in an extreme Islamic terrorist organization. And at the age of seven, his father sent him to a terrorist camp to start training. And so he was trained in weaponry and fighting in how to infiltrate the West, how to manipulate, how to use the Quran for manipulation. And so he was being trained in this. And when he was old enough, the, the organization said, all right, Kamal, we want you to go to America and start infiltrating our culture. You won't be carrying a gun, but you'll be carrying the Quran. And I want you to slowly start changing the culture and turning it. Kamal's like, okay, I'm a warrior for Allah. Where do you want me to go? We're going to send you to the south in the Bible, don't <laughs> And so Kamal's up to the challenge. And so he's in one of our towns. And he starts trying to convert people to his idea of Islam and to this terrorist organization. And he got a few young people and a few other people. But one day, while he's traveling down the road in his car, a semi-truck runs a light and smashes into him. And he gets thrown out of his car and it breaks his, he paralyzed, basically breaks his neck or injures his neck in some way. It doesn't kill him, but he injures his neck. And immediately, somebody saw it and they came to him. And Kamal realized it was a Christian. And so this man starts trying to bandage him, calls 911, they send him to a hospital. And because it's the Bible, though, the doctors and nurses there were Christians also. And the doctors and nurses kept telling Kamal, Kamal, you're going to make it. We're going to take care of you. We're, you're going to make it. You're gonna, we're going to take care of you. And he's in there for weeks, and maybe a few months, and he gets healed, but he needs to go through recovery, but he doesn't have a place to go. He can't afford rehab. He has no insurance. So this Christian doctor says, come on, why don't you come home with me? He said, I'm not worried about your past or where you come from. I'm worried about who you are now. Come on, come home with me. And so Kamal is getting recovery, and people are coming to visit him to help him in rehab, and he's getting better, and he cannot believe all the generosity and love that these Christians are showing him. And he wants to repay the favor, so when he gets well and he can move around, he starts helping out with a little bit of the chores. And he starts cooking and cleaning and vacuuming. And then one day, this doctor says, Kamal, I'm going to invite one of my friends over, and they're going to stay with us for a while. They're visiting and I want you to know, Kamal, it's a Jewish man. <laughs> and so Kamal's like, okay. <laughs> and so Kamal finds himself cleaning and cooking for these Jews and Christians who are supposed to be his enemies. But he cannot, he cannot help but feel this love that this Christian family has given him. And when he gets well enough, the doctor says, hey, Kamal, I stayed with you. This is actually my guest house. I stayed with you until you were well, but, but I'm going to go home now, and I'm going to give you the keys to this house. This is now your house. And by the way, I want you to go around the side of the house to the driveway, and you see that new car parked there? Because your car is smashed up, we bought you a brand new car. Come on, we just want to let you know that we love you. We, we love you. And Kamal takes the keys. He says, thank you so much. And he walks in the house and he shuts the door. And he starts, this gratitude starts turning into anger. Because he's been shamed as a Muslim. Because his enemies took care of him and loved him. And he says, how can that be? I have shamed my religion. I have shamed Allah. I have shamed the Quran. How... How could these Christians love me like this? They are my enemy. And so he goes and he gets a gun from the drawer and he puts it up to his head. And he goes to a window facing the east and he cries out with a gun to his head. And he says, Allah, I have shamed you. I'm about to kill myself. Answer me, Allah. Where are you? 
You know what Allah said that day? Absolutely nothing. And right he's about to pull the trigger, he cocks back the hammer, he hears another voice inside of him. And it says, Kamal, why don't you call out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And so Kamal puts down the gun, and he says, Father God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are you? And Kamal says that at that time he saw a vision, and he saw this man stand in front of him, and he said, who are you? And he says, I am Yahweh. I am Jesus. Kamal, look at my hands, look at my scars. But I'm a sinful man, Lord. Kamal, I have known you your entire life. I've created you. I know what you've done. But I have loved you through it all. Come on, just come to me. And I will give you a new life. Come on. And Jesus says, Come on, you are no longer their warrior. You are now my warrior. And Come on says, Lord, I will die for you. And Jesus says, Come on, I don't need you to die for me. I died for you so that you may live. And to this day, Kamal Salim goes all over the world preaching the gospel, reaching Muslims for Christ. So that they can find the love and the personal relationship with God. And why did this man's life change? Because of this scripture. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. When the love of God abounds more and more, People's lives change for the better. So here's your point today. Let your love abound more and more. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.